What do you look forward to about heaven? Well, if I'm to be very honest, and I don't think this is the right priority, I really look forward to being re reunited with my two wives. But I realize much more important than that is being in the presence of Jesus. But because of my deep personal involvement with my, each of my two wives, I think that's the thing that means the most to me about heaven. And I'm so grateful to God that we are not finally parted. I, I mean, my heart aches for people who pass through bereavement and don't have the assurance of a reunion in the next world. I, I, I feel so sorry for them. Just a couple more questions. What kind of a personal devotional pattern do you have, if there's any kind of a pattern? Oh, there's a very definite pattern with me. One of the things that became vivid to me early in my life was that God fed Israel in the wilderness with manna, but if they didn't gather it before the sun got hot, it melted. And I've always made it a principle to begin my day reading the scripture and in communion with the Lord. I also seek to end the day that way. Another thing I find is that a lot of Christians only know half of what's in the Bible. There are portions of the Bible they've never even read. I think that's a tragic, really, because who knows where you find what God has for you. I remember I met some people who never bothered to read the genealogies, I mean, these long lists of names. But I remember, I think it's in First Chronicles, being confronted with these genealogies. I thought, I'll plow through it. And then I came to these verses about Jabez. He was more honorable than his brethren. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Enlarge my coast and bless me, etc. And I thought, that's a good prayer. Now, that must have been about 1953. So I prayed the prayer that Jabez prayed. Well, God has done exactly what he did for Jabez. But if I hadn't read that, I would have missed it all. So my advice to all people who sincerely want to walk with the Lord is get to know everything that's in the Bible and ask the Lord to guide you. One thing I've heard you say as far as some of the legacy that you'll leave is if you had one book to leave, you would leave the Foundation Series, or now known as the Spirit-Filled Believer's Handbook. What is it about foundations that's so important to you? Well, foundations are essential. I mean, if you take it from the analogy, if you don't have a foundation, you can't build a house. And uh, I believe that the Scripture reveals there are six foundational doctrines, all stated in Hebrews chapter 6, repentance from dead works, faith toward God, the doctrine of baptism, laying on of hand, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And I believe those are the basic foundation truths which every Christian should have in his life if he's going to build a solid Christian life. So that's what motivated me to write that book, which was the foundation series and then became Spirit for the Believer's Handbook. And there are some churches here in the United States where every leader has to read that book and take a written examination on it. And believe me, they're doing pretty well. I think it's tragic when people try to build without a foundation. What concerns do you have about the body of Christ in America today? Well, if I'm to be frank with you and not being self-righteous, I think the greatest single problem that I see, I mean not saying that there are others that I don't see, is personal ambition in leaders. To build the biggest church, to have the longest mailing list, to hold the biggest meetings. I think it's very, very easy to become sidetracked by personal ambition. And I think it tends to build up barriers between one minister and another. I, I, I heard a man give his testimony once. He discovered a certain way to, to release the gift of the word of knowledge. And it was working so well for him, he wasn't going to share it with any other minister because they'd be as successful as he was. I mean... 
what what struck me was that seemed to him so natural. He wasn't apologizing for that. That was the way he looked at it. Of course, it's obviously an unspiritual approach. I mean, we should want to share success with as many other people as possible. Now, nobody is free from the temptation for personal ambition, certainly not myself. But I have seen the temptation, and I do guard against it. As you've watched the Church, the Body of Christ, in many nations over many years, are you encouraged or discouraged when you look at the average Christian's character? I wouldn't say I'm discouraged, but I'm disappointed. There's very little real emphasis on character in the great majority of Christian operations that I know of. And I don't know them all, but the ones I know there's more talk on success and prosperity and I believe success is God's will and God promises success but his standards of success are totally different from the carnal mind success is not building the largest church or driving the smartest car or having a swimming pool or whatever else or flying your own jet I mean, if that was the standard of success, then the people that are held forward as examples for us in the New Testament were abysmal failure. That's right. Let me suggest to you that many contemporary standards of success are greatly at variance with the Bible. I was uh, preaching in Ghana one time about the ministries, apostles, prophets, and there were a number of very fine young men there. And I said, uh, how many of you would like to be apostles? And quite a number stood up. So I said, hold on, wait a minute, let me give you the job description before you apply. So I went to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and I read these verses, beginning at verse 9. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like men condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to men. We are fools for Christ, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honoured, we are dishonoured. To this very hour we go hungry and thirsty, we are in rags, we are brutally treated, we are homeless, we work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. Up to this moment, we have become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. So having read those words, I said to the same young men, how, now how many of you would like to be apostles? Only about half of them stood up that time. And that's God's standards of success. I believe God wants us all to be successful. But I believe his standards are totally at variance with the standards of the modern age. And we have to decide whose standards are we going to be guided by. This is Jeffrey Buck. This interview with Derek Prince was such a highlight for me. I fell in love with Derek as a father figure in the Lord and a Bible teacher 25 plus years ago, and then to sit down across the table from this man that I so esteem, to fellowship and to ask questions and see his relentless curiosity, his passionate interest in spiritual things, to share some fun memories, and more than anything to see that Derek has not remotely quit, but is leaning forward to apprehend everything that God has for him. That is such a lesson to someone like me. I believe there are people across America who, in listening to someone like Derek, need to take note of the fact that they have a contribution to make, that they have a destiny, that they have a purpose. When I look at Brother Derek's life over these many years and his fathering of my generation, his passionate interest in the Scripture, his exposition of the original Hebrew and Greek words, which impacted me as a young man. 
I just have to give God the praise and the glory for his faithfulness and for Derek's faithfulness. And I want to encourage you as you listen to these messages, take heart to the fact that God can use any ordinary man like Brother Derek to change a world. 